Welcome, this is Eliyahu Shear from Chesed Ve'emet, www.lovingkindness.co. And today we're starting a new project. I hope that we'll be able to continue and we'll see how far we get with it. What we'll be doing is we're going to be studying Talmud. We're going to be studying from the beautiful Koren Talmud edition, the Adinstein, Rabbi Adin Steinsalt's edition. And we're going to be able to see the actual text on the screen as it appears in the Talmud itself. In other words, in his edition of the Korean Talmud. And the beautiful thing about this Talmud is it makes it very easy to understand how to learn Gemara. So what we're going to be doing is you're going to see exactly how he structures it. He takes it paragraph by paragraph with translation, which you're going to be able to see. And in addition to that, we're going to be learning the Halachot that come out from the Gemara itself, and we're going to learn some information about some of the key words in the Gemara as we go along, and we're also going to be uh, learning some biographies of some of the rabbis who take part in the discussion of the Talmud. So it's, it's quite a beautiful edition, and I highly recommend it if you're starting to get into Talmud and you're battling and you're not knowing what direction to take and you're looking for something to guide you through the process. This is a very beautiful edition, and that's why we're using it. I do have permission to make use of it. I'm not using it in any way in an illegal manner. I show it on the screen. What you see is exactly as it appears. And we're going to be reading it together. And I'm going to be adding in additional points that will hopefully add to the flavor of the Talmud. Although in and of itself, what we're going to see is certainly even itself by itself is quite enough. Now, the Talmud basically is the oral law of the Jewish people. And what happened was from the time of Moses, from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Torah was passed down from teacher to student, from student who became teacher to student, and so on and so forth. And throughout the generations, everything that we're going to learn about in the Talmud was passed on in this oral manner. But unfortunately, as with all things that take place through the dispersion, the Jewish people having to go through all sorts of galut, exiles from one place to the next, it wasn't always so easy to keep tabs of every single thing that was going on in the oral law. And although the oral law was supposed to be something that should have remained in an oral capacity only, the truth of the matter is it had to eventually be written down to a certain extent. Now, the Talmud itself is broken up into two different sections. The first section is known as the Mishnah. And the Mishnah was compiled by Rabbi Yehuda, ha, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. And it was compiled in approximately the year 200 of the Common Era, in accordance with the general counting, not in accordance with the Hebrew uh, years. And many years later, 300 years later, the Talmud was compiled as the Gemara, and it was compiled by Ravina and Rav Ashi in particular, and all the rabbis, of course, who were involved, but they were the main rabbis who were responsible for editing and putting the whole thing together. So what we're going to be looking at is the various discussions that took place throughout history through the various rabbis who discussed the points that we're going to see. And we're going to find one of the interesting things about learning Talmud is that in the Talmud itself, there isn't really a conclusion. We read the discussions and very often we wonder where the discussion has led. But what we're going to do is that if you read in your Talmud, you'll see that there are different sections on a page of Talmud, which we're not looking at at the moment. But there are parts that are referenced to the actual halakha. And what we're going to do as we work through the material is we're going to be looking at the halakha as it has been written down by Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz in this Korean Talmud edition. And hopefully we, I have made some notes as to the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew references and we'll be able to look at it in the Hebrew itself. So altogether, it's a fascinating study and I hope that you'll enjoy it. If you have any questions, of course, be in touch. Go to my website, be in touch with me, send me any questions that you have via email, and I'll be delighted to answer and discuss anything of interest. Now, we're starting off, the Talmud actually has uh, six sections to it. There, that's why it's called the Shas, the Shisha, Sidarim, the six orders of the Talmud. And within these different orders, there are numerous tractates known as Masechtot. And the first section that we're learning about of the first section, the first section is called Zira'im, which has to do with the laws of sowing, the laws of agriculture, 
the, the laws of sowing seeds and the prohibited uh, mixtures and so on and so forth. But interestingly enough, the very first Gemara in the Seder of Zra'im is called Brachot, which apparently has nothing to do with all of this agricultural law. But what is interesting, of course, is that ultimately agricultural law deals with fruits, uh, vegetables, foods that we're going to eat. And after all, if we're going to be observing all the laws of the agriculture, at some point in time, we're going to be eating the fruits or the vegetables that have been planted. And as a result of that, we're going to have to make brachot. So, in fact, the Talmud begins with Masechet Brachot, with the tractate dealing with the laws of blessings. Just a short introduction. Let's just give an idea of what this is all about. Basically, we know that it is forbidden to eat any food without make, making a blessing before eating the food. Likewise, when one finishes eating the food, provided one has eaten a sufficient amount, one makes a blessing after one has eaten. And then there are all sorts of blessings that we recite on various occasions. We, write, we recite blessings when it's a, a big simcha of some kind, like on a Yom Tov, when you say Sheikh Yanu. We recite brachot when we buy new clothing, for example, depending on the particular type of clothing that we buy. So we should make the bracha or we don't make the bracha. We recite brachot on various occasions when we see lightning, when we hear thunder, all sorts of things come into our lives. And we have to recite a blessing to acknowledge that God is there, a part of what it is that is taking place. What is fascinating is that the whole idea of blessings is to keep ourselves attached to God, which means as follows. When you wake up in the morning, it's easy to be attached to God, relatively speaking, if we are fulfilling all the mitzvot. We can say more de'ani when we wake up. We can go to shul, we can daven, we can, all the time we can feel some sort of a connection to God in the activities that we're involved in. But by the time we've finished our davening and we want to get on with the rest of the day, we become so involved in the day's activities that we might forget that God is around us. And even if we're involved in business, we, we forget sometimes that God is the one who is in charge of all the business activity that's taking place. Because of this, we are fortunate that the rabbis have instituted the laws of blessings. In essence, what a blessing is, it is time out. It is a moment in time where we take ourselves away from the activity of the general life experience. And at this point in time, we focus on God and we remind ourselves that God is there. It's kind of like a pit stop. We imagine that the speeding car is traveling around the, uh, the race the 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 race tracks and as it's going around all of a sudden things start going out of hand and uh, wheels are going to fall off in the car and all sorts of things and so the driver of the car has to realize he needs to make a pit stop when he makes a pit stop immediately the team climb in they change the wheels they check whatever is necessary and boom the fellow is back on the road again in and he's part of the race well god wants us to check in all the time to our connection to him. And in order to do that, because we become so involved in this race, literally uh, the, the, the race of life, we move from one activity to the next and we forget that God is in our lives. So God says, take a break. And every now and again, so to speak, you should force yourself to make this blessing, to make a pit stop and to acknowledge that God is there at that point in time. One of the most prominent points in time that we can connect with God, of course, is when we eat food. Because when we eat food, we usually have to sit down, we have to take some time, we have to, we have to uh, chew on the food. It takes us time to deal with the food in front of us. Whereas many other activities can happen very quickly, food is something which takes longer to deal with. And therefore, since it happens so frequently during the day that we need to eat things, there's breakfast, there's lunch, there's supper, sometimes people are having tea and they're having cake, or whatever people are having during the day, it gives people the opportunity to check in with God and make a connection. This is the beauty of what brachot are all about. We're going to learn in tractate brachot that, in fact, there is a mitzvah to recite 100 brachot every single day. Now, that means to say, for example, if we eat something like a fruit, we make a blessing on it. When we finish eating the fruit, we make another blessing on it. When we pray to God, we recite 19 blessings, let's say, in the Amidah. 
and we recite two blessings before the Shema and blessings after the Shema, and we recite various other blessings during the day. We go to the bathroom, we need to make a blessing to thank God that our body is working correctly. Anybody who has ever had the experience when their bodies do not work correctly and they feel like they would do anything just to get their bodies working correctly should take well, well take note that when their bodies are working correctly and they feel healthy, that when they've gone to the bathroom, they leave and they make a blessing that God has created the body in a healthy manner to allow it to function and not cause a person additional pain. So altogether, a person has an opportunity and he should make an opportunity for at least 100 blessings every single day of his life. If we take that into account, 100 blessings every single day over 30 days will give us 3,000 blessings every single month. 3,000 blessings every month is going to give us 36,000 blessings each year. Within 10 years, we're going to have accumulated 360,000 brachot to our names. And as the years go by and our lives go by, we could um, fulfill a possibility of perhaps 2 million blessings in our lives. This is an amazing thing. So many people are going around looking for blessing. They say they look for the rabbi or they look for the tzaddik or they look for somebody, give me a blessing, give me a blessing. And yet we are a nation that has the opportunity of blessing all by ourselves from the fact that the rabbis have already instituted that we should make every single day 100 blessings. This gives us the opportunity to have in our lives, in our entire lifespan, perhaps up to 2 million blessings in our entire lives. Let us take note of that. If that is the case, we need to learn the laws of brachot and we need to learn them well. That is because since we're going to be reciting these brachot every single day, 100 brachot, 2 million brachot in our lifetimes, let's say, we need to make sure we know the laws, the halachot, for the recitation of the brachot. We need to know when to say it. We need to know how to say it. We, know, we need to know exactly how much time to spend on each bracha that we say and exactly when to say it and when not to say it so as to avoid reciting a bracha levatala, a bracha in vain. With this short introduction, let us look a little bit now into the tractate brachot itself. We're going to be reading here from the Koren Talmud in the introduction. I'm not reading through the entire introduction. It will take far too long. But as we go through the material, you're going to have the opportunity to follow me in the text to see exactly what the text says. There's nothing that I'm saying that is outside of the text, unless, of course, it adds to the flavor of the Gemara. And that is basically the way that I enjoy to give a shiur. I like people to see the actual words of the Torah itself, and they can't turn around at any point in time and say, well, where does it say that? Or who said that? Or you're making that up. This is what the words of the Torah teach us. And everybody who is watching this shiur will have the opportunity to see and learn for themselves exactly what the Gemara is saying, and also stand the chance of being able to learn how to learn the Gemara. It's true. We're not going to be looking at the actual page of the Gemara in front of us. We're going to instead look at the edition of the Korean Talmud in order to help us get through the steps of the Talmud. Anybody who wants to, after having gone through the Shi'ur, can easily open up a Gemara afterwards with the original text, and then to try to work through the Gemara by himself and perhaps refer back to the text that we're learning over here. So we see over here, I'm looking at the middle of the page, Tractate Brachot, which contains most of the halachot of Shema, prayer and blessing, is divided into nine chapters. So the very first tractate of the Talmud, called Brachot, introducing the whole world of the oral law, blessings into the whole world of oral law, consists mostly of the halachot, of the laws, of the Shema, of prayer, the Amidah, and blessings in general. We're going to see that there are nine chapters that we have to get through. The first three chapters deal with Shema. Chapter one, in which the obligation to recite Shema is discussed, along with the times when it may be recited and the details of this obligation. I'd just like to pause here and make an introduction and say, it is fascinating, as I just gave this short introduction about blessing being the first tractate of the entire oral law, that the first Mishnah that we're going to learn about within tractate Brachot 
deals with the laws of the Kriyat Shema. Now, why should that be so interesting? It is interesting because perhaps one of the greatest themes of what it means to be a Jew is to connect with the unity of the one God in the world. And this is the mitzvah of the Shema. The very first Mishnah of the entire Talmud is going to be a Mishnah that teaches us about the most essential thing about being Jewish. And that is Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. That here Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And from here, all of Torah comes out, flows out. Now, it's interesting again, because the highest level that the Torah tells us when a Jew dies, when he leaves this world, he should always strive to be able to recite the Shema before he leaves this world. Just as he's entering the oral law by reciting the Shema, as he enters into his journey into understanding what the oral law is all about, he enters with the Shema. He enters his life with the Shema. He enters his life with the one God. So too, when a person leaves the world, he should try or she should try to be able to have the opportunity to recite the Shema before dying. Which means to say, if a person, for example, is, God forbid, on their deathbed, then while they are lying there, they should try as close as possible to that moment that they're going to leave this world, they should try to recite the Shema as being the last words on their mouth. We know the famous story of Rabbi Akiva, who was tortured by the Romans, and as his skin was being flayed off his body, and he was in tremendous pain, what did he do? He recited the Shema. He said the first line of the Shema. And he expired as he recited the very last word of that first line, reciting the word Echad. He died with the word Echad on his lips. This is perhaps the greatest level of death that a Jew can experience, that he dies with the unity of God. He dies with the ultimate belief that he knows that what life is all about in this world is his connection with God and doing what God wants from him through fulfilling all the mitzvot of the Torah. This is the beautiful idea that we're starting off the entire Torah, the entire oral tradition with the Shema. And when we leave the world, we leave the world with the Shema again. What better way, what more beautiful way to introduce the oral Torah than with the Mishnah that teaches us perhaps the most important thing in our life, the recitation of the Shema. We are going to be reciting the Shema each day, every single day of our lives, at least twice a day, mostly four times a day, sometimes even five times a day, depending on one's custom of the various prayers that one says, we will find out that there is a mitzvah to recite the Shema in the morning, a mitzvah to recite it at night, and throughout the day there are other times, depending on if a person wears two pairs of tefillin, as a male, he'll, say, he'll recite the Shema again. In the early morning, there's a time to recite the Shema. When he goes to sleep at night, he recites the Shema yet again, five times during the day, six times during the day. The Shema is a central part of the life of a Jew. If he is not reciting the Shema on a regular basis every single day of his life, he is losing out on what it means to be a Jew. And if he is looking for anything to remind him of his duty and what it means to be a Jew, let him recite the Shema. What is the proof? The entire Torah begins with the recitation, with the Mishnah of the mitzvah of reciting the Shema. In chapter one, we're going to be learning about the obligation to recite the Shema, along with the times when it may be recited and the details of this obligation. In chapter two, we're going to be discussing more about the specific problems related to the manner in which the Shema may be recited, which is going to be resolved, and regulations governing its recitation are discussed. In chapter three, in which there is a discussion of special cases in which a person is exempt from reciting Shema and the Amidah prayer. Then we continue in Tractate Brachot, which consists of nine chapters. It's the first tractate of the entire oral, tra uh, oral tradition. In the following two chapters, we deal with prayer. Chapter four, in which parallel to chapter one, determinations of the time of the various prayers is discussed. Chapter five, in which the halachot of prayer are elucidated in greater detail and depth, along with an explanation of the essence of prayer and regulations governing prayer. The following three chapters 
deal with appropriate conduct at a meal, as well as the blessings recited before and after eating. So we've moved on now from Shema. We move into the area of prayer, and then we move into an area of eating food. And of course, everybody knows as a, as a human being, nobody can get away without, eat, without eating every single day, perhaps a few times in order to sustain himself and to give himself the energy that he needs to serve God. The reason for this is because ultimately within the food, uh, one will find hidden the sparks of refinement that need to be sought out in this world and elevated back to Hashem from the time that this world was created. And all of these sparks are sitting in the food. When we make the blessing and we eat the food and we then use that food, we use the energy of that food to do the things that we need to do to serve Hashem, we do further acts of kindness, we pray, we study Torah, we do the things that God wants us to do, we elevate that food to a higher level and we fulfill our mission in what God wants from us. Eating is an important and crucial part of the life of a Jew. It is one of the most important areas that a Jew needs to focus on, and that is the area of kashrut, in which everything has to be done in accordance with all the, um, the, the abundant laws that are involved. What types of animals one can eat, and uh, not mixing meat and milk, and uh, how, to, how to remove the blood from an animal, and all sorts of different halakhot, which we're not going to be learning about in this masechet. But what we are going to be learning about is that when we take that food and we eat it, we must recite a blessing before the food and we must recite a blessing after the food when we've finished eating it. So chapter six is going to be dealing with the primary focus on the blessings of enjoyment that one recites over food, drink and other pleasures. Chapter seven, which is devoted to grace after meals and the invitation, the zimun to participate in joint recitation of grace after meals. Chapter 8, in which incidental to the discussion of blessings associated with the meal, a list of disputes between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel with regard to appropriate conduct at a meal and the halachot of blessings is cited. The following chapter deals with blessings recited in response to various phenomena. Now, chapter 9, we're going to see, includes within it the blessings recited in different circumstances, blessings which determine the attitude toward virtually every phenomenon, common and uncommon, that one encounters in the course of, in, of his life. Chapter 9 also deals with the mystery of dreams. And this is fascinating, all part of Masechet Brachot. So here we are, we're at the beginning of the first tractate of the entire oral law. And it's a fascinating tractate. We're going to just read over here the introduction, but we're not going to go through the entire introduction because it will take us too long. Where he begins by quoting the uh, Chumash itself from the words of Devarim in Deuteronomy, where it says, Hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you arise. A beautiful teaching from the Chumash itself, from the written law. It's essential, and it's telling us the key components of the Jew's life. That Hashem is one, God is one. Our mitzvah is to love him with all our soul, and all the heart and soul and might. And all of these things that we learn about here, all of the teachings of the Torah, need to be put onto our hearts and to be taught to our children. And we involve ourselves in the mitzvah of the study of Torah, in the words of the Torah, with our children, by ourselves, all the time, when we sit in our house, when we're going about things, whatever things that we're doing, and even when we go to sleep, the first thing that we do, as we're, as, or the last thing that we do just before we go to sleep, as we're about to go to sleep, is we recite the Kriyat Shema, and we close our eyes, having recited these words of acknowledging God's unity, because ultimately, uh, as everybody knows, when we go to sleep at night, none of us really know whether or not we will wake up in the morning. People die, God forbid, in their sleep. And so therefore, when we go to sleep, we hope and pray that God will return our souls the next morning when we awaken. But it is not necessarily true. And therefore, if it turns out 
that we go to sleep at night and we don't wake up, we will effectively have gone to sleep with the words of the Kriya Shema on our lips, the acknowledgement that God is one. Okay, so here we are now. We're moving into the text itself in the Talmud. We're going to be reading probably all of this that we see on the page here. Let's enjoy it together. For me, it's as much an experience to learn this like I'm learning it the first time, just as perhaps it might be for you, the listener, whoever happens to be listening to this, if it's your first time. Well, good luck, and I hope that you will come back to these teachings again and again, and each time that you look at it, see it as the first time, because each time that one sees these words, it makes a further impression on one. It makes one realize just how special these words are, how special the Torah is, and how special it is to have this connection with Hashem through fulfilling these mitzvot. Now, we begin over here, as you see in the left corner over here, Perik 1, which means chapter 1, Daf 2, Amud Aleph. Each page in the Talmud is called a Daf, and the Daf, the page itself, is divided into two sections. The one is on the one side of the page, and when you turn over, there is the writing that appears on the other side of the page. On the first side of the page, it's called Amud Aleph, and on the second side of the page, it's called Amud Beit or uh, Amud A, Amud B, side A and side B. It's interesting to note that the Talmud, in fact, begins on Daf Beit, on page 2. The Talmud does not begin like most books do on page number 1, but rather it begins on page number 2. And the reason why this is so, uh, there are different ideas, and we can go into more detail uh, and there's no end to it of all the different ideas that one can come up with. But many people say that the idea is that it starts on page two to tell us a secret. That when we study the Talmud, when we get to the end of the tractate and we say, well, you know, how many pages have you learned? They say, I've learned so many pages in Brachot or whatever it is, Shabbos or Erufin, whichever uh, Gemara I happen to be learning. That's how many pages I learned and I've finished it, the person says. So they say, well, did you learn the first page? So they say, uh, what do you mean by that? Well, we ask them, did you learn page number one? So they say, well, of course not. We started on page number two. So uh, you, didn't, you, didn't let's, you didn't even start learning the Talmud yet because you didn't get to page one. And even when you've learned all of the Talmud, there's a vast section of the whole of Torah that still hasn't been studied. And until a person studies all these sections, it's as if he didn't even yet start. And this is a wonderful thought that we can take with us as we begin our journey together. Now, the beginning of Tractate Brachot, the first tractate in the first of the six orders of the Mishnah, opens with a discussion of the recitation of Shema. As the recitation of Shema uh, encompasses an acceptance of the yoke of heaven and of the mitzvot, and as such forms the basis for all subsequent teachings. The Mishnah opens with the laws regarding the appropriate time to recite Shema. If you look in this beautiful edition over here, you will see along the way that there are certain letters which indicate what's going on in the story to help us understand what's happening. Here, for example, you see there's an N by the word Shema, which means that there's a note. And so we can already go down to the area of where we see the notes. And here we see opening with the recitation uh, of the Shema, Hapatika Bekriyat Shema. Since this tractate discusses the laws of blessings and prayers, it opens with the laws of the recitation of Shema, a biblical commandment that applies every day and which constitutes the acceptance of the yoke of heaven. So what better way to start the Talmud than with this idea of the Shema, which is so central to everything that we do during the day. And the Gemara begins, the Mishnah begins and says, Me'e Masai, from when? Me'e Masai kur'in et Shema the Mishnah begins, from when do we begin reciting the Shema in the evening? In other words, from what time does one recite the Shema in the evening? Says the Mishnah, The time for the recitation of the Shema in the evening is from that moment that the Kohanim enter to eat their Shema. Ad sof ha'ashmura harishona, until the end of the first God. Divrei Rabbi Eliezer. These are the words of Rabbi Eliezer. It's interesting once again to think about 
But as we said before, why start the whole of the Talmud with the mitzvah of Shema? And the answer is simple. Because as we see from this very Mishnah, what really is the first mitzvah that a Jew fulfills every single day? Remember, the day of a Jew begins in the night time. We know that because it says in the Torah, when God created the world, Vayi Erev, Vayi Voker, Yom Echad. One day, the first day, began with the evening and then proceeded to the morning, which means to say that evening is the start of the day. So when it becomes the evening, we begin with a mitzvah. What is the first mitzvah of that day? It is the recitation of the Kriyat Shema. And think about this for a second. What is the very first mitzvah that a bar mitzvah boy will fulfill when he becomes bar mitzvah? Indeed, it is the mitzvah of the recitation of the Kriyat Shema. Because when he turns 13, it will be in the evening of the date of the day that he was born. And the evening begins this process when he becomes an adult. And so the first mitzvah that he's going to have the opportunity to fulfill is going to be the mitzvah of the recitation of the Kriyat Shema. And this is the theme. Just as it is that the first mitzvah that a Jew will ever come to do really properly, because when he enters into the stage that he has to perform mitzvot, so he says the Kriyat Shema, so too when a Jew leaves this world, he also wants it to be that he should leave this world in a way that he recites the Kriyat Shema. He rounds off his entire life through reciting the Kriyat Shema at the time that he becomes a Jew in the fullest sense, in the fulfillment of all the mitzvot, and then he leaves this world as he also recites the Kriyat Shema. Over here we see that there is an H mentioned over here which tells us that there is a Halakha. Because what happens here is as we're reading the Mishnah, we don't really know what the Halakha is. All we read about are different opinions. The Mishnah tells us, asks a question, when do we start reciting the Kriyat Shema in the evening? And then afterwards tells us from the time when the, when the priests enter to partake of their Truma, all right, all is well and good. But we'll notice that as we get to the Gemara, we're going to find uh, numerous arguments exactly when this time is. And ultimately, we need to know, practically speaking, when do we recite the Kriyat Shema in the evening? Because there are going to be a variety of opinions. So already, the H over here takes us into the future and says at the end of the day, there's still going to be a halakha. There's still going to be a law that comes out from it. What will that law be? Well, if we go over here to the Mishnah Torah, over here in the Mishnah Torah written by the Rambam, Hilchos Kriyat Shema, Perik Aleph, and uh, Mishnah Tet, we see over here, what does the Rambam teach us? Rabbi Moshe Maimonides, he says, Ezehu Zman Kriyat Shema Belayla. When is it the time for reading the Kriyat Shema in the evening? And this is the halacha, the Maisa. Here is the practical halacha, meaning in accordance with the Rambam's opinion, who obviously we have to take note of, which is vital. Mitzvasa, Rishas, Yitzias, Hakokavim, the time that we begin reciting the Kriyat Shema in the evening is from the time that the stars come out in the evening. Ad Katsi Halayla until the a middle point of the night. Then the Rambam continues and adds, and he says to us, the imavar, if the time passed by, the ikher, and the person was delayed, the kara, ad and he read the Kriyat Shema, and the pillar of dawn had not yet come about. Yatsa yedei kovaso. He fulfills his obligation. Shelo Amru Adchatzos, because the rabbis didn't say that he could read the Kriyat Shema only until midnight, except for the purpose of distancing a person away from sin. Ah, oh, this makes sense now. The Rambam puts things into perspective. He says, What is the bottom line? When may I begin reciting the Kriyat Shema in the evening? And the Rambam teaches us straight. From the Mishnah, the Mishnah is telling us the general rule, and the Rambam is codifying it in his work of Halakha. And he says to us 
that the time for the recitation of the Kriyat Shema is the time from when the stars come out. And now let's just put this into perspective for a moment. The evening begins at two different points of time. The first point in time is when the sun begins to set over the horizon. And then it sets, the, it sets, 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 it goes lower and lower until ultimately it disappears off the horizon and the stars come out. You might think that the evening begins already when the sun begins to set. Well, the Rambam says to us that the mitzvah of reciting the Kriyat Shema is in fact when the stars come out, which is a later period in time. In other words, when we look outside and we see that the stars have come out, this is an indication that we can already recite the Kriyat Shema in the evening. Now, the Rambam continues and he says, if a person transgressed, which means to say he should have recited the Kriyat Shema at the time that the stars came out, and he delayed. What should he do? How long can he say the Kriyat Shema for in the evening? As long as Amut HaShachar has not yet come about. As long as the pillar of dawn has not yet come about. When at that point in time, if one looks outside, one can see that the, there is a certain ray of light that begins to enter into the area that one is living. But it is not yet the sun. Rather, it is just a flow of light that one can begin to see. And slowly but surely the sun begins to rise until ultimately it comes over the horizon. And we talk about this as being the night sachama, when the sun blossoms up and one can see the sun clearly, which is a very special time. And it's a special time for governing, for doing the Amidah, as we're going to learn about later on. So if a person is unsure, when can he recite the Kriyat Shema in the evening? The halacha, as brought down by the Rambam, is clear. You may already begin to recite the Kriyat Shema from Yetzias HaKokavim, when the stars come out. And if need be, you can even recite it until Amud HaShachar. And then the Rambam adds some interesting words. He says, he says, uh, 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 Amud HaShachar, He says that the rabbis didn't say that you could only say the Kriyat Shema until Chatzos. Why did they say that? In order to hold a person back, to prevent them and distance them from the possibility of committing an Avera. Meaning, the rabbi said that a person should recite the Kriyat Shema by no later than midnight. However, why did the rabbi say that if really you could read the Kriyat Shema up until Amud HaShachar? The answer is to prevent a person from committing a sin. What will happen? He will go to sleep and he'll think that perhaps he can recite the Kriyat Shema until Chatzot. And he'll fall fast asleep. And when will he wake up? He'll wake up just already after it's Amud HaShachar. And he'll lose out on saying the Kriyat Shema that evening. So therefore the rabbi said, say the Kriyat Shema before Chatzot. But the truth of the matter is, they only put that there as a preventative measure. The reality is, is if you're awake and it's two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning and the, and the Amud HaShachar, the pillar of dawn, has not yet come up, you can still recite the Kriyat Shema. And this, of course, is what the, what the Mishnah says over here. The Mishnah is going to speak about this idea. It says, from the time when the priests enter to partake of their Truma, and afterwards it says, until when does the time for the recitation of the evening Shema extend? Until the end of the first watch, says the Mishnah. The term used in the Torah to indicate the time for the recitation of the evening Shema is Peshoch Pecha, which means when you lie down, which refers to the time in which individuals go to sleep. Therefore, the time for the recitation of the Shema is the first portion of the night, when individuals typically prepare for sleep. This is the statement of Rabbi Eliezer, but the Chachamim Omrim Ad Chatzois, the rabbis say that you can recite the Kriyat Shema only until Chatzois. You can do it until midnight. Rabban Gamliel says, Rabban Gamliel Omer, Ad Shiyale Amut HaShachar, until the pillar of dawn comes up. That is the time that you may recite the Kriyat Shema. Already from those three opinions, we can see exactly where the Rambam had uh, codified the Halakha. He began by cod codifying the Halakha by telling us, he began by codifying the Halakha by telling us that 
uh, when is the time for Kriyat Shema? The mitzvah is from the time of the coming out of the stars until half of the night, till midnight. And if he transgressed and he read until Amud HaShachar, just like it was over here that we saw until Chatzot, which is the Chachamim, and then Rabban Gamliel tells us until Amud HaShachar. So even until Amud HaShachar, he fulfilled his obligation. And why is it therefore that the Chachamim said until Chatzot to prevent a person from transgressing over that point and unfortunately missing out on saying the Kriyat Shema altogether. Now, we continue one step further and we look in the Shulchan Aruch. And the Shulchan Aruch, which was written by Rabbi Yosef Cairo, let's just put things into perspective again. The Rambam, Rabbi Moshe Maimonides, the Rambam, he lived from 1135 or 1138 until 1204, whereas the Rabbi Yosef Cairo, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, who codified the Jewish code of Jewish law, he lived from 1488 to 1575. So he's a few hundred years, a couple of hundred years later after the Rambam. And the Shulchan Aruch codifies everything in a way that we can fulfill the halakha in a more practical way. Of course, when one studies halakha practically, one needs to investigate all the different sources in halakha. We need to see what does the Mishnah say. We need to see what does the Talmud say. Then we go ahead and we look at the Rambam and we look at the Shulchan Aruch and we look at the commentaries on these different sections of Halakha. Until today, we even ask the rabbis of each generation to clarify certain points that might not be too clear for us. Now, the Shulchan Aruch, listen to the wording of the Shulchan Aruch. Zman kriyat shmer shel aravit ubo dalitzifim. This is the mitzvah of the time of the Kriyat Shema in the evening, and it includes within it four se'ifin, four paragraphs. Zman Kriyat Shema Balayla, says the Shulchan Aruch, writing just a couple of hundred years later after the Rambam, three, 300 years later, Zman Kriyat Shema Balayla, the time for the reading of the Shema in the evening, is Misha'as Yetziat Shlosha Kokavim Ketanim, is from the time where the three small stars Come out in the sky. Then he continues. If it is a day that is cloudy, he should wait until all doubt leaves his heart. Which means to say, because it's a cloudy day, he's not quite sure whether or not it's dark yet. When he looks outside, he sees the darkness from the clouds and he thinks to himself that perhaps it's already the evening. But maybe it's not the evening. So Rabbi Yosef Karo, the Mechaber of the Shulchan Aruch, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, tells us that one should wait a little bit longer in order to make sure that it is indeed the evening proper. The Im Kriya called them Lachain, and if he was reading it before that, Lachain, therefore, Therefore, what a person should do is if he turned out that he did read it and it was a cloudy day and he wasn't certain if it was the right time, what should he do? He should return and he should read it without the blessings. If the congregation proceed to read, they advance to read the Kriyat Shema, yom, while it is still daytime, what is the Mechaber speaking about? The Mechaber is teaching us that in certain communities, they daven ma'ariv while it is still daytime, when the stars have not yet come out. Can you do this or not? We will learn later that there is a way to do it. But should one do this as a preferable way of doing things? Perhaps not. But what about if one is daven in a community and they daven the Kriyat Shema at the time that was before the stars came out. What should one do? So if this takes place, what should he do? It says here, Yikra imahim. A person should read the Kriyat Shema together with the Tzibur, with the community. Kriyat Shema u seha, The Kriyat Shema together with its blessings. V'yit palel imahim. And he should daven together with them, which is a big mitzvah. zman. And then when the time arrives, now the stars have come out. And you can recite the Kriyat Shema. Koire Kriyat Shema below Brachot. He can read the Kriyat Shema without 
the blessings. Now, this means to say that if it turns out that he recited already the Kriyat Shema together with the Tzibur, then when the correct time comes, he should repeat the Kriyat Shema, but he doesn't have to recite the blessings because he already said the blessings. Says the Ramah, now the Ramah was another outstanding uh, posek to help uh, teach us the way of Halakha, and his opinions are included within the Shulchan Aruch, and in particular, he is addressing the Ashkenazi community because the Mechaber in general is going to address only the Sephardi community. And the Ramah, beginning here with the word Hagar, is going to address the Halakha for the Ashkenazi community. And the Ramah says, Umihu, however, Lo Yachazor Vit Palel Belaila, he should not return and pray at night time. He says he shouldn't pray again his whole tefillah at night time, even though the community proceeded by quite a lot in, and it was before the evening. Unless, of course, he is used to the fact with other means of separation and piety. The eyes law mitkaze ki yehoira because then it's not going to look like he's being arrogant. Mashi yachzor umitpalel in that that he returns and he davens and he brings down exactly where he got the source for this halakha. Again, in the orachaim in the first section of the Shulchan Aruch, we see over here again that the mechaber is codifying the halakha, and he says lechatchila preferably. Tariqli quotes Kriyat Shema. Preferably, one should read the Kriyat Shema. Miyad b'tzeta kokavim. Immediately, as soon as the stars come out, this is the correct time to recite the Kriyat Shema. Exactly what the Mishnah said. Uzmana ad chatziha laila. And the time for reading it, you can continue to read the Kriyat Shema if you missed out and you didn't daven at the correct time in the early evening. You can continue until the halfway point at night, at midnight. Exactly what the opinion of the Chachamim is. That is what the rabbi said, until the halfway point in the evening. And if a person transgressed and he delayed, he went past that. And he read, and until at least it wasn't yet the dawn break, Yatsa Yedei Kovasor. He fulfills his obligation. Look how beautiful that is. The Shulchan Aruch has codified for us, just like the Rambam had codified for us exactly what the Halakha is with regards to the recitation of the Kriyat Shema. When do we begin reciting the Kriyat Shema in the evening? From the time that the Kwanim enter to eat their Truma. Well, nobody seems to know exactly when this time is at this point in time. But from the Halakha, we know when this point of time is. It's going to be Tzaytzakuchavim, when the stars come out. And until when can one recite the Kriyat Shema? Until the end of the first watch. That was the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. The Chachamim, the sages, however, say until Chatzois, which is exactly what was codified in the Halakha, that ultimately the best way of doing it, if you didn't manage to do it right at the first moment when the stars came out, recite the Kriyat Shema until Chatzot, until midnight, and you'll still be okay. And Rabban Gamliel Omer, Rabbi Gamliel said, until the pillar of dawn. Meaning, if you didn't manage to recite the Kriyat Shema until midnight, you could continue to recite the Kriyat Shema right up until that point of time where it becomes the pillar of dawn. And so was the Halakha codified. There we see it in the Rambam, and we see it also in the Shulchan Aruch. If we see over here what he says, one may recite Shema until dawn, indicating that b'shoch b'cha, because the mitzvah is, sa is saying that we recite the Kriyat Shema, b'shoch b'cha, uvekumecha, when you go to sleep and when you awaken. When is it that you go to sleep? It is to be understood as a reference to the entire time that people sleep in their beds, which is the whole night. So the rabbis and all of the halakha is coming to teach us that in the written Torah it says, you know when you should recite the Kriyat Shema, you should recite the Kriyat Shema, b'shoch b'cha, uvekumecha. When you lie down and when you get up. But none of us really know when we lie down. Well, what type of a time period is that? 
Is it the early evening? Is it the middle part of the evening? Is it the later evening? Some people lie down when it becomes night time. Other people lie down at midnight. Other people lie down at three o'clock in the morning. So according to this, I need to know an exact time when to recite the Kriyat Shema. Therefore, the Halakha comes and says to us, the ideal time to recite the Kriyat Shema in the evening is when the stars come out. If you don't manage to do it by that time, do it until Chatzot. And if you still don't manage to do it by that time, do it until Ya'ale Amud Hashachar, until the dawn, the pillar of dawn comes up. If so, why was the other opinion even given? Why do we need to know the opinion of the rabbis that they say do it only until Chatzot? It's irrelevant. We know the halacha. You could do it ad ad amut hashachar until the pillar of dawn. The rabbis were teaching us an additional something. Be careful with mitzvot. Always put safeguards in place. Because if there's a safeguard in place, then you can always protect yourself from overstepping the safeguard and do what you need to do before it's too late. And if accidentally you might overstep the safeguard, you might still be safe. But if the safeguard isn't there, the nature of people is often to wait until the last minute. And if we wait until the last minute, which is really until the pillar of dawn comes up, so then we'll lose out altogether if we miss out on our opportunity. Now the Mishnah continues. My say, there was a story. A story happened. Uba uban of me beisamishte. And his sons came from a wedding, meaning who? The sons of Rabbi Eliezer, of course. The sons of Rabbi Eliezer, sorry, the sons of Rabban Gamliel, sorry, the sons of Rabban Gamliel came to him and they said to him, Amrulo, lo karinu et shema, we didn't yet read the shema. Oh, Marlahim, meaning they were asking a question. Uh, they said, Dad, uh, we went to a uh, wedding. And it, things were so busy that we didn't even have time to recite the Kriyat Shema. So they asked him, could you tell us when is it that we can still say the Kriyat Shema until? Because it was now early in the morning and they didn't know what to do. And didn't the rabbis tell us that we should be careful to recite the Kriyat Shema only up until Chatzois? And here they were returning from a wedding and it was already past Chatzois. And they didn't know what to do. So they came to their father and they asked him, well, can you please tell us, Dad, uh, Abba, when is it that we can recite the Kriyat Shema until? Omar Lahim, Rabban Gamliel said to them, Im lo ala amut hashachar, if the pillar of dawn has not yet arisen, chayavim atem ikrot, you are obligated to read. Which means to say, Rabban Gamliel says, over here, that you have until Amud HaShachar. Rabban Gamliel is holding by his ruling that you can say the Kriyat Shema right up until Amud HaShachar. But we have a principle in Halakha. When there is an individual opinion, and then there is an opinion of the rabbis, who are the majority, the opinion of the majority always holds strong. So therefore, if the Chachamim say until Chatzos, but Rabban Gamliel, who's just one opinion, and he says you can say it until Amud HaShachar, whose opinion should we be following? We should follow the opinion of the Chachamim. So the sons of Rabban Gamliel were asking, uh, Abba, do we have to restart the Kriyat Shema by Chatzot? Because if we do, we've lost out. On the other hand, you gave an opinion and you said until Amud HaShachar. Rabban Gamliel said, Banai, my sons, I can tell you, the correct time is you can say it right up until Amut HaShachar. Bilvad. Not only this he said, Amru, with regards to the rabbi saying that things can only be done until Chatzois, until midnight. Elakol Mashe Amru Chachamim. That wherever the Chachamim said, Ad Chatzois, that you could only do the mitzvah until mid midnight. Mitzvasan Ad Shiyale Amut HaShachar. The mitzvah of those things applies until Amut HaShachar. So Rabbi Gamliel was basically telling us an insight here. He was saying to his sons that the rabbis themselves agree that Kriyat Shema may be recited up until Amut HaShachar. Why then did the rabbis say to us 
that we have to say the Kriyat Shema only until Chatzois, we already know the answer. Because in fact, the Rambam codified for us the answer when he said here, Shelo Amru Ad Chatzois. Why did the rabbi say until Chatzois when they knew you could recite the Kriyat Shema? Really until Amud Ashakar? It was in order to prevent a person to distance him from committing a sin. What was the sin? If you tell the fellow, you've got to say the Kriyat Shema only until Amud Ashakar, he will wait until the last minute. And then when Amud Ashakar happens, he'll have no, he has no safety fence in place and he'll be in trouble. But if you tell him until Chatzot, then when Chatzot comes, he'll already be worried. Maybe he's overstepping the mark. Maybe he made a mistake. Then he'll realize he didn't yet make a mistake. He's still safe. And he'll be able to recite the Kriyat Shema at the correct time. Let us learn a little bit about these statements that we've been reading about over here. Number one, we're going to just read very quickly who was Rabban Gamliel. Rabban Gamliel, who we've mentioned over here with the story of his sons and who has told us that we can recite the Kriyat Shema until Amud HaShachar, who was this rabbi, who was this personality? He was the Nasi of the Sanhedrin. He was the president of the Sanhedrin. He wasn't just uh, one of the people around town. He was the Nasi of the Sanhedrin. What he said counted. He had, he had value to his words. And he was one of the most important Tanaim in the period following the destruction of the Second Temple. That means to say that the people who wrote down the Mishnah, the people who were responsible, the teachers inside the Mishnah, they were called Tanaim. Whereas the people who were responsible for the Gemara were known as the Amoraim. The Tanaim, they called Tanaim from the word Tana, which means like Mishnah, to teach because they taught. Whereas the rabbis of the Gemara are known as the Amoraim because they would say the teachings that they had learnt from the previous rabbis. So he was one of the most important Tanaim in the period following the destruction of the Second Temple. Rabban Gamliel's father, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel the Elder, had also been Nasi of the Sanhedrin, as well as one of the leaders of the nation during the rebellion against Rome. Rabban Gamliel was taken to Yavne by Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai after the destruction of the temple, so that he became known as Rabban Gamliel of Yavne. After Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai's death, Rabban Gamliel presided over the Sanhedrin. Now, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, just very briefly, was in fact one of the students of Hillel. Many of us have heard of Hillel and Shammai. And these were the greatest leaders in that generation. And Hillel had 80 students. The least of the students was Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. But he would be responsible for taking the Torah of his Rebbe and transmitting it to the next generation. So Rabban Gamliel was taken to Yavne by Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai after the destruction of the temple so that he became known as Rabban Gamliel of Yavne. And after his death, after the death of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabban Gamliel presided over the Sanhedrin. Under Rabban Gamliel's leadership, Yavne became an important spiritual center. The greatest of the sages gathered around him including Rabbi Eliezer, Rabban Gamliel's brother-in-law. Rabbi Eliezer was, in fact, Rabbi Eliezer ben Hukanos, who we can learn more about uh, at a future occasion. He was also Rabban Gamliel's brother-in-law. But by uh, coincidence, he wasn't, he was a pupil, he was a, a, a comrade, he was his brother-in-law. Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. All of these were the students of uh, Rabban Gamliel, all of these, all of these rabbis, they were students, they were also chaveirim, they were also friends. Rabban Gamliel sought to create a spiritual center for the Jews that would unite the entire people, a role filled by the temple until its destruction. Therefore, he strove to enhance the prominence and central authority of the Sanhedrin and its nasi. His strict and vigorous leadership eventually led to his colleagues to remove him from his post for a brief period replacing him with Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. We're going to learn about that in Gemara Brachot. This is an amazing story. And it's amazing to see that all of these people, and their opinions, of course, are outstanding and great, etc. But at the same time, we're going to learn that these people are real people. They have real interactions with the rabbis and the friends of their generation to such a degree that often there are great fights amongst them. And in this particular instance, we see that such a, a fight arose, we're going to learn about it later on, that in fact he was demoted from his level of being the Nasi of the Sanhedrin 
and he was replaced for a brief period of time by Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. And we know everybody who, who has a Pesach Seder knows well the story of Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, who took over the Nasius of the Sanhedrin at the tender age of only 18 years old. And we know the story that his beard suddenly grew out into gray hairs. And when people looked at him, they saw that he looked like a mature individual, even though he was a very young man. But he was he was appointed as the Nasi of the of the gener of the Sanhedrin at that point in time after this episode took place with Rabban Gamliel, who was removed from his office. However, since everyone realized that his motives and actions were for the good of the people and were not based on personal ambition, they soon restored him to his position. So we're going to learn more about this later on. And actually, I see we've run out of time, so we're going to stop over here. When we start again, we'll read more about Rabban Gamliel. And we'll also take a look in more detail to understand the times of what is called the morning, what is called the evening. We'll look at a calendar to help us understand the time so that we can see for ourselves exactly what time one can begin to recite the Kriyat Shema. In today's times, we want to see the actual time, and we don't want to just know it's dark, or we don't want to know that it's just the stars came out. We want to know the exact time. We need to find a calendar that will show us these things, and we need to learn how to use that calendar. So I would like to introduce that hopefully in the next Shi'ur. And then continue with the who was, who, uh, biographies of who was Rabban Gamliel and also some more background into the different themes that we're discussing in this first Mishnah. Meanwhile, I thank you very much for joining me. And uh, again, I say I'm Eliyahu Shir from Chesed Ve'emet. You can find my site at www.lovingkindness.co. And I look forward to you, please. To be in, 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 interact with me, feel free to send me an email. You can also partake of the Shi'ur, which is, uh, which is given as a public Shi'ur. If you want to partake of it live and have the opportunity to ask any questions or take part in the Shi'ur, you are more than welcome to. Just send me an email and I will add you to the, uh, to the Skype group. And you can partake of the Shi'ur live together with us. Whoever wants to join, please feel free to. I thank those who have come to the Shi'ur. Thank you very much for joining me. You've made the Shi'ur special and allowed me to express myself and to take part in the Shi'ur. I hope that you will join me again and we will continue the Shi'ur. And I look forward to continuing onwards. I wish you everything of the best. Please see my site. And if you've enjoyed this sheet or also, please like this video and click on the like button. Click on subscribe to subscribe to my channel and also click on the bell so that you'll be notified when new Shirim come about. And then I look forward to being in touch with you whenever you uh, feel that you would like to send me an email and be in touch. Please do so. I wish you everything of the best and shalom, shalom. Take care until next time. Bye-bye.